Welcome to part three of Aladdin and the Wonderful Lamp. If you've missed the earlier parts, there is a link to part one in the description below, as well as a link to the text of this part. As you likely remember, in the last part, Aladdin got a secret view of the Princess Beldobador, and he fell instantly in love with her and decided he had to have her as his wife. Now, Aladdin and his mother were living very simply and were not of a class to expect such a match. But he so impressed Sultan with an exquisite gift of jewels from the cave of the lamp that the Sultan promised to give her to him. However, the Sultan later changed his mind. But finally, with a much larger gift than the first provided by the genie of the lamp, the Sultan agreed that they could be married. Aladdin has not yet personally met the Sultan, and he has just heard that the marriage is on and he has to prepare to go to the palace to meet the Sultan. Let's listen. In the meantime, Aladdin's mother got home and showed in her countenance the good news she had brought her son. My son, said she to him, you have now all the reason in the world to be pleased. The sultan, with the approbation of the whole court, has declared that you are worthy to possess the princess Bedrobador and waits to embrace you and conclude your marriage. Therefore, you must think of making preparations for your interview, which may answer the high opinion he has formed of your person. Aladdin, enraptured with this news, made little reply, but retired to his chamber. There, after he had rubbed the lamp, which had never failed him, the obedient genie appeared. Genie, said Aladdin, I want to bathe immediately, and you must afterward provide me the richest and most magnificent habit ever worn by a monarch. No sooner were the words out of his mouth than the genie rendered him invisible and transported him into a bath of the finest marble where he was undressed, without seeing by whom, in a magnificent and spacious hall. From the hall he was led to the bath, which was of a moderate heat, and he was there rubbed with various scented waters. After he had passed through several degrees of heat— he came out quite a different man from what he was before. His skin was clear, white, and red, his body lightsome and free, and when he returned into the hall he found, instead of his own, a suit the magnificence of which astonished him. The genie helped him to dress, and when he had done, transported him back to his own chamber, where he asked him if he had any other commands. Yes, answered Aladdin, I expect you to bring me as soon as possible a charger that surpasses in beauty and goodness the best in the Sultan's stables, with a saddle, bridle, and other caparisons worth a million of money. I want also twenty slaves as richly clothed as those who carried the present to the Sultan to walk by my side and twenty more to go before me in two ranks. Besides these, Bring my mother six women slaves to attend her, as richly dressed at least as any of the Princess Baldrobodors, each carrying a complete dress fit for any sultaness. I also want ten thousand pieces of gold in ten purses. Go and make haste. As soon as Aladdin had given these orders, the genie disappeared, but presently returned with the horse, the forty slaves, ten of whom carried each a purse containing ten thousand pieces of gold, and six women slaves, each carrying on her head a different dress for Aladdin's mother, wrapped up in a piece of silver tissue. Of the ten purses, Aladdin took four which he gave to his mother, telling her those were to supply her with necessaries. The other six he left in the hands of the slaves who brought them, with an order to throw them by handfuls among the people as they went to the sultan's palace. The six slaves who carried the purses he ordered likewise to march before him, 
three on the right hand and three on the left. Afterward, he presented the six women slaves to his mother, telling her that they were her slaves and that the dresses they had brought were for her use. When Aladdin had thus settled matters, he told the genie he would call for him when he wanted him, and thereupon the genie disappeared. Aladdin's thoughts now were only upon answering as soon as possible the desire the sultan had shown to see him. He dispatched one of the forty slaves to the palace with an order to address himself to the chief of the porters to know when he might have the honor to come and throw himself at the sultan's feet. The slave soon acquitted himself of his commission and brought for an answer that the sultan waited for him with impatience. Aladdin immediately mounted his charger, and though he never was on horseback before, appeared with such extraordinary grace that the most experienced horseman would not have taken him for a novice. The streets through which he was to pass were almost instantly filled with an innumerable concourse of people who made the air echo with their acclamations, especially every time the six slaves who carried the purses threw handfuls of gold among the populace. Neither did these shouts of joy come from those alone who scrambled for the money, but from a superior rank of people who could not forbear applauding Aladdin's generosity. Not only those who knew him when he played in the streets like a vagabond did not recollect him, but those who saw him but a little while before hardly recognized him, so much were his features altered. Such were the effects of the lamp as to procure by degrees to those who possessed it perfections suitable to the rank to which the right use of it advanced them. Much more attention was paid to Aladdin's person than to the pomp and magnificence of his attendants, as a similar show had been seen the day before, when the slaves walked in procession with the present to the sultan. Nevertheless, the horse was much admired by good judges who knew how to discern his beauties without being dazzled by the jewels and richness of his furniture. When the report was everywhere spread that the sultan was going to give the princess in marriage to Aladdin, nobody regarded his birth nor envied his good fortune, so worthy he seemed of it in the public opinion. When he arrived at the palace, everything was prepared for his reception, and when he came to the gate of the second court, he would have alighted from his horse agreeably to the custom observed by the Grand Vizier, the commander-in-chief of the empire and governors of provinces of the first rank. But the chief of the mace-bearers, who waited on him by the sultan's order, prevented him, and attended him to the grand hall of audience where he helped him to dismount. The officers formed themselves into two ranks at the entrance of the hall. The chief put Aladdin on his right hand, and through the midst of them led him to the sultan's throne. As soon as the sultan perceived Aladdin, he was no less surprised to see him more richly and magnificently habited than ever he had been himself, then struck at his good mane, fine shape, and a certain air of unexpected dignity, very different from the meanness of his mother's late appearance. But notwithstanding, his amazement and surprise did not hinder him from rising off his throne and descending two or three steps quickly enough to prevent Aladdin's throwing himself at his feet. He embraced him with all possible demonstrations of joy at his arrival. After this civility, Aladdin would have thrown himself at his feet again, but he held him fast by the hand and obliged him to sit close to the throne. Aladdin then addressed the sultan, saying, I receive the honor which your majesty out of your great condescension is pleased to confer, but permit me to assure you that I know the greatness of your power, and that I am not insensible how much my birth is below the luster of the high rank to which I am raised. I ask your majesty's pardon for my rashness, but I cannot dissemble that I should die with grief were I to lose my hopes of seeing myself united to the divine princess who is the object of my wishes. My son, answered the sultan, embracing him a second time, you would wrong me to doubt for a moment of my sincerity. Your life from this moment is too dear to me not to preserve it by presenting you with the remedy which is at my disposal. After these words, the sultan gave a signal, and immediately the air echoed with the sound of trumpets, hautboys, and other musical instruments. And at the same time, he led Aladdin into a magnificent hall, where was laid out a most splendid collation. The sultan and Aladdin ate by themselves with the grand vizier and the great lords of the court according to their dignity and rank, 
sat at different tables. The conversation turned on different subjects, but all the while the sultan took so much pleasure in looking at his intended son-in-law that he hardly ever took his eyes off him. And throughout the whole of their conversation, Aladdin showed so much good sense as confirmed the sultan in the high opinion he had formed of him. After the feast, the sultan sent for the chief judge of his capital and ordered him to draw up immediately a contract of marriage between the princess Bedrobador, his daughter, and Aladdin. When the judge had drawn up the contract in all the requisite forms, the sultan asked Aladdin if he would stay in the palace and solemnize the ceremonies of marriage that day. To which he answered, Sir, though great is my impatience to enjoy your majesty's goodness, yet I beg of you to give me leave to defer it till I have built a palace fit to receive the princess. Therefore I petition you to grant me a convenient spot of ground near your abode that I may more frequently pay my respects and I will take care to have it finished with all diligence. Son, said the sultan, take what ground you think proper. There is space enough on every quarter round my palace. But consider I cannot see you too soon united with my daughter, which alone is wanting to complete my happiness. After these words he embraced Aladdin again, who took his leave with as much politeness as if he had been bred up and had always lived at court. Aladdin returned home in the order he had come amidst the acclamations of the people who wished him all the happiness and prosperity. As soon as he dismounted, he retired to his own chamber, took the lamp and called the genius before, who in the usual manner made him a tender of his service. Genie, said Aladdin, I have every reason to commend your exactness in executing hitherto punctually whatever I have demanded. But now, if you have any regard for the lamp, your protector, you must show, if possible, more zeal and diligence than ever. I would have you build me, as soon as you can, a palace opposite, but at a proper distance from the sultan's, fit to receive my spouse, the Princess Bedrobador. I leave the choice of the materials to you, that is to say, porphyry, jasper, agate, lapis lazuli, or the finest marble of various colors, and also the architecture of the building." but I expect that on the terrace roof of this palace you will build me a large hall crowned with a dome and having four equal fronts, and that instead of layers of bricks the walls be formed of massy gold and silver laid alternately, that each front shall contain six windows, the lattices of all which, except one which must be left unfinished, shall be so enriched in the most tasteful workmanship with diamonds, rubies, and emeralds that they shall exceed anything of the kind ever seen in the world. I would have an inner and outer court in front of the palace and a spacious garden. But above all things, take care that there be laid in a place which you shall point out to me a treasure of gold and silver coin. Besides, the edifice must be well provided with kitchens and offices, storehouses, and rooms to keep choice furniture in for every season of the year. I must have stables full of the finest horses, with their equerries and grooms and hunting equipage. There must be officers to attend the kitchens and offices, and women slaves to wait on the princess. You understand what I mean. Therefore, go about it and come and tell me when all is finished." By the time Aladdin had instructed the genie respecting the building of his palace, the sun was set. The next morning before break of day, our bridegroom, whose love for the princess would not let him sleep, was up when the genie presented himself and said, Sir, your palace is finished. Come and see how you like it. Aladdin had no sooner signified his consent than the genie transported him thither in an instant, and he found it so much beyond his expectation that he could not enough admire it. The genie led him through all the apartments where he met with nothing but what was rich and magnificent, with officers and slaves all habited according to their rank and the services to which they were appointed. The genie then showed him the treasury, which was opened by a treasurer, where Aladdin saw heaps of purses of different sizes piled up to the top of the ceiling and disposed in most excellent order. The genie assured him of the treasurer's fidelity, and thence led him to the stables, where he showed him some of the finest horses in the world, and the grooms busy in dressing them. 
From thence they went to the storehouses, which were filled with all things necessary, both for food and ornament. When Aladdin had examined the palace from top to bottom, and particularly the hall with the four and twenty windows, and found it much beyond whatever he could have imagined, he said, Genie, no one can be better satisfied than I am, and indeed I should be much to blame if I found any fault. There is only one thing wanting which I forgot to mention, that is to lay from the sultan's palace to the door of the apartment designed for the princess a carpet of fine velvet for her to walk upon. The genie immediately disappeared, and Aladdin saw what he desired executed in an instant. The genie then returned and carried him home, before the gates of the sultan's palace were opened. When the porters, who had always been used to an open prospect, came to open the gates, they were amazed to find it obstructed, and to see a carpet of velvet spread from the ground entrance. They did not immediately look how far it extended, but when they could discern Aladdin's palace distinctly, their surprise was increased. The news of so extraordinary a wonder was presently spread through the palace. The grand vizier, who arrived soon after the gates were opened, being no less amazed than others at this novelty, ran and acquainted the sultan, but endeavored to make him believe it to be all enchantment. Vizier, replied the sultan, why will you have it to be enchantment? You know as well as I that it must be Aladdin's palace, which I gave him leave to build for the reception of my daughter. After the proof we have had of his riches, can we think it strange that he should raise a palace in so short a time? He wished to surprise us and let us see what wonders are to be done with money in only one night. Confess sincerely that the enchantment you talk of proceeds from a little envy on account of your son's disappointment. When Aladdin had been conveyed home and had dismissed the genie, he found his mother up and dressing herself in one of those suits which had been brought her. By the time the sultan rose from the council, Aladdin had prepared his mother to go to the palace with her slaves and desired her, if she saw the sultan, to tell him she should do herself the honor toward evening to attend the princess to her palace. Accordingly she went, but though she and the women slaves who followed her were all dressed like sultanesses, yet the crowd was not near so great as the preceding day because they were all veiled, and each had on an upper garment agreeable to the richness and magnificence of their habits. Aladdin, taking not to forget his wonderful lamp, mounted his horse, left his paternal home forever, and went to the palace in the same pomp as the day before. As soon as the porters of the sultan's palace saw Aladdin's mother, they went and informed the sultan, who immediately ordered the bands of trumpets, cymbals, drums, fifes, and hautboys placed in different parts of the palace to play so that the air resounded with concerts, which inspired the whole city with joy. The merchants began to adorn their shops and houses with fine carpets and silks and to prepare illuminations against night. The artisans of every description left their work, and the populace repaired to the great space between the royal palace and that of Aladdin, which last drew all their attention, not only because it was new to them, but because there was no comparison between the two buildings." but their amazement was to comprehend by what unheard of miracle so magnificent a palace could have been so soon erected, it being apparent to all that there were no prepared materials or any foundations laid the day before. Aladdin's mother was received in the palace with honor and introduced into the Princess Badrobador's apartment by the chief of the eunuchs. As soon as the princess saw her, she rose, saluted, and desired her to sit down on a sofa, and while her women finished dressing and adorning her with jewels which Aladdin had presented to her, a collation was served up. At the same time, the sultan, who wished to be as much with his daughter as possible before he parted with her, came in and paid the old lady great respect. Aladdin's mother had talked to the sultan in public, but he had never seen her with her veil off as she was then. And though she was somewhat advanced in years, she had the remains of a good face, which showed what she had been in her youth. The sultan, who had always seen her dressed very meanly, not to say poorly, was surprised to find her as richly and magnificently attired as the princess's daughter. 
This made him think Aladdin equally prudent and wise in whatever he undertook. When it was night, the princess left her own apartment for Aladdin's palace, with his mother on her left hand, carried in a superb litter, followed by a hundred women slaves dressed with surprising magnificence. All the bands of music which had played from the time Aladdin's mother arrived being joined together led the procession followed by a hundred state ushers and the like number of black eunuchs in two files with their officers at their head. Four hundred of the sultan's young pages carried flambeaux on each side, which, together with the illuminations of the sultan's and Aladdin's palaces, made it as light as day. At length the princess arrived at the new palace, and Aladdin ran with all imaginable joy to receive her at the grand entrance. His mother had taken care to point him out to the princess in the midst of the officers who surrounded him, and she was charmed with his person. "'Adorable princess,' said Aladdin, accosting her and saluting her respectfully as soon as she had entered her apartment." If I have the misfortune to have displeased you by my boldness in aspiring to the possession of so lovely a creature, I must tell you that you ought to blame your bright eyes and charms, not me. Prince, answered the princess, I am obedient to the will of my father, and it is enough for me to have seen you to tell you that I obey without reluctance. Aladdin, charmed with so agreeable an answer, would not keep the princess standing, but took her by the hand, which he kissed with the greatest demonstration of joy, and led her into a large hall illuminated with an infinite number of wax candles, where by the care of the genie a noble feast was served up. The dishes were of massy gold and contained the most delicate viands, and all the other ornaments and embellishments of the hall were answerable to this display. The princess, dazzled to see so much riches, said to Aladdin, I thought, prince, that nothing in the world was so beautiful as the sultan my father's palace. But the sight of this hall alone is sufficient to show I was deceived. Then Aladdin led the princess to the place appointed for her, and as soon as she and his mother were seated, a band of the most harmonious instruments, accompanied with the voices of beautiful ladies, began a concert which lasted without intermission to the end of the repast. The princess was so charmed that she declared she had never heard anything like it in the sultan her father's court. But she knew not that these magicians were fairies chosen by the genie, the slave of the lamp. When the supper was ended, there entered a company of female dancers who performed, according to the custom of the country, several figure dances, singing at the same time verses in praise of the bride and bridegroom. About midnight the happy pair retired to their apartments, and the nuptial ceremonies were at an end. The next morning, when Aladdin arose, his attendants presented themselves to dress him, and brought him another habit as magnificent as that worn the day before. He then ordered one of the horses appointed for his use to be got ready, mounted him, and went in the midst of a large troop of slaves to the sultan's palace. The sultan received him with the same honors as before, embraced him, placed him on the throne near him, and ordered a collation. Aladdin said, I beg your majesty will dispense with my eating with you today. I came to entreat you to take a repast in the princess's palace, attended by your grand vizier and all the lords of your court. The sultan consented with pleasure, rose up immediately, and preceded by the principal officers of his palace, and followed by all the great lords of his court, accompanied Aladdin. The nearer the sultan approached Aladdin's palace, the more he was struck with its beauty, but was much more amazed when he entered it, and could not forbear breaking out into exclamations of approbation. But when he came into the hall and cast his eyes on the windows enriched with diamonds, rubies, emeralds, all large perfect stones, he was so much surprised that he remained some time motionless. After he recovered himself, he said to his vizier, Is it possible that there should be such a stately palace so near my own and I be an utter stranger to it till now? Uh, sir, replied the grand vizier, 
Your Majesty may remember that the day before yesterday you gave Aladdin, whom you accepted for a son-in-law, leave to build a palace opposite your own, and that very day at sunset there was no palace on this spot. But yesterday I had the honor first to tell you that the palace was built and finished. Oh, I remember, said the Sultan, but never imagine that the palace was one of the wonders of the world. For where in all the world besides shall we find walls built of massy gold and silver instead of brick, stone, or marble, and diamonds, rubies, and emeralds composing the windows? The Sultan would examine and admire the beauty of all the windows, and counting them found that there were but three and twenty so richly adorned, and he was greatly astonished that the twenty-fourth was left imperfect. Vizier, said he, for that minister made a point of never leaving him, I am surprised that a hall of this magnificence should be left thus imperfect. Sir, replied the Grand Vizier, without doubt Aladdin only wanted time to finish this window like the rest, for it is not to be supposed but that he has sufficient jewels for the purpose, or that he will not complete it at the first opportunity. Aladdin, who had left the Sultan to go and give some orders, returned just as the Vizier had finished his remark. Son, said the Sultan to him, this hall is the most worthy of admiration of any in the world. There is only one thing that surprises me, which is to find one of the windows unfinished. Is it from the forgetfulness or negligence of the workmen, or want of time, that they have not put the finishing stroke to so beautiful a piece of architecture? Uh, sir, replied Aladdin, it was for none of these reasons that your majesty sees it in this state. The omission was by design. It was by my orders that the workmen left it thus since I wished that your majesty should have the glory of finishing this hall. If you did it with this intention, replied the sultan, I take it kindly and will give orders about it immediately. He accordingly sent for the most considerable jewelers and goldsmiths in his capital. Aladdin then conducted the sultan into the saloon where he had regaled his bride the preceding night. The princess entered immediately afterward and received her father with an air that showed how much she was satisfied with her marriage. Two tables were immediately spread with the most delicious meats, all served up in gold dishes. The sultan was much pleased with the cookery and owed he had never eaten anything more excellent. He said the same of the wines, which were delicious, but what he most of all admired were four large buffets profusely furnished with large flagons, basins and cups, all of massy gold set with jewels. When the sultan rose from table, he was informed that the jewelers and goldsmiths attended, upon which he returned to the hall and showed them the window which was unfinished. I sent for you, said he, to fit up this window in as great perfection as the rest. Examine well and make all the dispatch you can. The jewelers and goldsmiths examined the three and twenty windows with great attention and after they had consulted together, they returned and presented themselves before the sultan, when the principal jeweler, undertaking to speak for the rest, said, Sir, we are all willing to exert our utmost care and industry to obey your majesty. But among us all we cannot furnish jewels enough for so great a work. I have more than are necessary, said the sultan. Come to my palace, and you shall choose what may answer your purpose. When the sultan returned to his palace, he ordered his jewels to be brought out, and the jewelers took a great quantity, particularly those Aladdin had made him a present of, which they soon used without making any great advance in their work. They came again several times for more, and in a month's time had not finished half their work. In short, they used all the jewels the sultan had, and borrowed of the vizier, but yet the work was not half done. Aladdin, who knew that all the sultan's endeavors to make this window like the rest were in vain, sent for the jewelers and goldsmiths, and not only commanded them to desist from their work, but ordered them to undo what they had begun and to carry all their jewels back to the sultan and to the vizier. They undid in a few hours what they had been six weeks about and retired, leaving Aladdin alone in the hall. He took the lamp which he carried about him, rubbed it, and presently the genie appeared. Genie, said Aladdin, I order thee to leave one of the four and twenty windows of this hall imperfect, and thou hast executed my commands punctually. Now I would have thee make it like the rest. The genie immediately disappeared. Aladdin went out of the hall and returning soon after, 
found the window like the others. In the meantime, the jewelers and goldsmiths repaired to the palace and were introduced into the sultan's presence where the chief jeweler, presenting the precious stones which he had brought back, said in the name of all the rest, Your majesty knows how long we have been upon the work which you were pleased to set us about, in which we used all imaginable industry. It was far advanced when Prince Aladdin commanded us not only to leave off but to undo what we had already begun and bring your majesty your jewels back. The sultan asked them if Aladdin had given them any reason for so doing, and they, answering that he had given them none, he ordered a horse to be brought, which he mounted and rode to his son-in-law's palace with some few attendants on foot. When he came there, he alighted at the staircase which led to the hall with the twenty-four windows and went directly up to it without giving previous notice to Aladdin. But it happened that at that very juncture Aladdin was opportunely there and had just time to receive him at the door. The sultan, without giving Aladdin time to complain obligingly of his not having given notice that he might have acquitted himself with the more becoming respect, said to him, Son, I come to know myself the reason why you commanded the jewelers to desist from work and take to pieces what they had done. Aladdin disguised the true reason, which was that the sultan was not rich enough in jewels to be at so great an expense, but said, I beg of you now to see if anything is wanting. The sultan went directly to the window which was left imperfect, and when he found it like the rest, fancied that he was mistaken. Examined the two windows on each side, and afterward all the four and twenty, but when he was convinced that the window which several workmen had been so long about was finished in so short a time, he embraced Aladdin and kissed him between his eyes. My son, said he, what a man you are to do such surprising things always in the twinkling of an eye. There is not your fellow in the world. The more I know, the more I admire you. Aladdin received these praises from the sultan with modesty and replied in these words, Sir, it is a great honor to me to deserve your majesty's goodwill and approbation, and I assure you I shall study to deserve them more. The sultan returned to his palace, but would not let Aladdin attend him. When he came there, he found his grand vizier waiting, to whom he related the wonder he had witnessed with the utmost admiration, and in such terms as left the minister no room to doubt but that the fact was as the sultan related it. Though he was the more confirmed in his belief that Aladdin's palace was the effect of enchantment, as he had told the sultan the first moment he saw it. He was going to repeat the observation, but the sultan interrupted him and said, "'You told me so once before.' I see, vizier, you have not forgotten your son's espousals to my daughter. The grand vizier plainly saw how much the sultan was prepossessed, therefore avoided disputes, and let him remain in his own opinion. The sultan, as soon as he rose every morning, went into the closet to look at Aladdin's palace and would go many times in a day to contemplate and admire it. Aladdin did not confine himself in his palace, but took care to show himself once or twice a week in the town by going sometimes to one mosque and sometimes to another to prayers, or to visit the grand vizier, who affected to pay his court to him on certain days, or to do the principal lords of the court the honor to return their visits after he had regaled them at his palace. Every time he went out, he caused two slaves who walked by the side of his horse to throw handfuls of money among the people as he passed through the streets and squares, which were generally on those occasions crowded. Besides, no one came to his palace gates to ask alms, but returned satisfied with his liberality. In short, he so divided his time that not a week passed, but he went either once or twice a haunting, sometimes in the environs of the city, sometimes farther off, at which time the villages through which he passed felt the effects of his generosity, which gained him the love and blessings of the people, and it was common for them to swear by his head. With all these good qualities he showed a zeal for the public good which could not be sufficiently applauded. He gave sufficient proofs of both in a revolt on the borders of the kingdom. For he no sooner understood that the sultan was levying an army to disperse the rebels than he begged the command of it, which he found not difficult to obtain. As soon as he was empowered he marched with so much expedition that the sultan heard of the defeat of the rebels before he had received an account of his son-in-law's arrival in the army. Aladdin had conducted himself in this manner several years when the African magician, who undesignedly had been the instrument of raising him to so high a pitch of prosperity, 
recalled him to his recollection in Africa, whither after his expedition he had returned. And though he was almost persuaded that Aladdin must have died miserably in the subterranean abode where he had left him, yet he had the curiosity to inform himself about his end with certainty. And as he was a great geomancer, he took out of a cupboard a square covered box which he used in his geomantic observations. After he had prepared and leveled the sand which was in it with an intention to discover whether or not Aladdin had died, he cast the points, drew the figures, and formed a horoscope by which, when he came to examine it, he found that instead of dying in the cave, his victim had made his escape, lived splendidly, was in possession of the wonderful lamp, had married a princess, and was much honored and respected. The magician no sooner understood by the rules of his diabolical art that Aladdin had arrived to this height of good fortune than his face became inflamed with anger, and he cried out in a rage, "'This sorry tailor's son has discovered the secret and virtue of the lamp! I believed his death to be certain, but find that he enjoys the fruit of my labor and study. I will, however, prevent his enjoying it long, or perish in the attempt.' He was not a great while deliberating on what he should do, but the next morning mounted a barb, set forward, and never stopped but to refresh himself and his horse till he arrived at the capital of China. He alighted, took up his lodging in a khan, and stayed there the remainder of the day and the night. The next day his first object was to inquire what people said of Aladdin, and taking a walk through the town he went to the most public and frequented places where persons of the best distinction met to drink a certain warm liquor, which he had drunk often during his former visit. As soon as he had seated himself, he was presented with a cup of it, which he took, but listening at the same time to the discourse of the company on each side of him, he heard them talking of Aladdin's palace. When he had drunk off his liquor, he joined them, and taking this opportunity, inquired particularly of what palace they spoke with so much commendation. "'From whence come you?' said the person to whom he addressed himself. "'You must certainly be a stranger not to have seen or heard talk of Prince Aladdin's palace.' "'I do not say,' continued the man, "'that it is one of the wonders of the world, "'but that it is the only wonder of the world, "'since nothing so grand, rich, and magnificent was ever beheld. "'Go and see it, and then judge whether I have told you more than the truth.' Uh, "'Forgive my ignorance,' replied the African magician. "'I arrived here but yesterday from the farthest part of Africa, "'where the fame of this palace had not reached when I came away. "'The business which brought me hither was so urgent "'that my sole object was to arrive as soon as I could "'without stopping anywhere or making any acquaintance. "'But I will not fail to go and see it "'if you will do me the favor to show me the way thither.' The person to whom the African magician addressed himself took a pleasure in showing him the way to Aladdin's palace, and he got up and went thither instantly. When he came to the palace and had examined it on all sides, he doubted not but that Aladdin had made use of the lamp to build it. Without attending to the inability of a poor tailor's son, he knew that none but the genies, the slaves of the lamp, could have performed such wonders, and peeked at it quick. At Aladdin's happiness and splendor, he returned to the Khan where he lodged. The next point was to ascertain where the lamp was, whether Aladdin carried it about with him or where he kept it, and this he was to discover by an operation of geomancy. As soon as he entered his lodging, he took a square box of sand, which he always carried with him when he traveled, and after he had performed some operations, he found that the lamp was in Aladdin's palace, and so great was his joy at the discovery that he could hardly contain himself. Well, said he, I shall have the lamp, and I defy Aladdin to prevent my carrying it off, thus making him sink to his original meanness from which he has taken so high a flight. 